purposes of uh, the awakened talks is to plant seeds for a more compassionate world uh, while fostering our own inner transformation and behind each uh, one of these talks there is uh, there is a whole entire team of service based volunteers whose invisible work allows us to hold this space uh, today our special guest is Mekin Maheshwari so thank you for joining us for today's call Mekin um, let us start with a minute of silence uh, to anchor ourselves in this space Thank you and welcome back. I'm going to hand it over to Nipun Mehta, who's going to engage uh, with a, in a conversation with Megan. But before I introduce Nipun Bhai, uh, we invite you to share your reflections or questions with us, uh, either uh, through a comment box, which is on the live stream page, or you could email us with your questions and reflections at askas at the rate service space dot org. So just a line of introduction for Nipun Mehta. He is uh, the founder of Service Space, which is an incubator of projects that serve, uh, uh, that serve gift culture. While he does so much through Service Space in the world, what moves me the most is how he shows up uh, in each and every moment. And one of the things that I know about him is that uh, he, he makes his wife loves tea. And he, made, he took it on himself that, you know, every single day he would make a cup of tea for his wife. And I don't know from past how many years he's done that every single day. I know he's married for at least 20 years now. So that's like, uh, you know, like a simple act doing every day, no exit. So that's Nipun Bhai. Uh, over to you, Nipun Bhai. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Swara. It's such a joy to be here, um, and especially a joy for to be in the presence of our guest speaker here, uh, who is someone I'm delighted to introduce. I think most people have probably read everything about Macon online, um, and even outside of like the wonderful bio that the Awaken Talks team put together, even otherwise, you might know about Macon. But in brief, I would say, you know, he was he's an entrepreneur. He went from you know, various startups uh, and, and bigger companies like Yahoo to ultimately at Flipkart. Uh, but where his journey became very interesting is how he went from like being the president of engineering at uh, Flipkart to uh, then being chief people officer, taking this company from a handful of people to uh, at least a 30,000, and now it's a lot more even, uh, laying the foundation for all of that, being the people officer, being in that corporate world, being very successful, and then saying, hey, this is perhaps not my deepest calling. So going on a very different track, right? An uncharted territory of sorts. Uh, and we'll get into that. It, it was a track of service. It's a track of education. It's a track of deep potential. Um, so I'm excited to have uh, this time together with Macon. Uh, Macon, before I start with my first question, I just want to say welcome. And we're so glad that you're here. Thank you, Nipun Bhai. It's um... It's a joy to be uh, back in service space. Um, I think the times I have spent with you um, at the Gandhi 3.0 retreat uh, with folks from service space have been the most joyous, uh, the most, um, the ones that filled the heart to the brim and like overflow. Uh, so just delighted to be here. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. And in fact, I want to start there making uh, so my first introduction to you, or at least, and not the, you know, on paper introduction, or even when we meet, we had met in Bangalore earlier, but my first introduction was right before that retreat, we had an Aspen retreat. And there's a particular moment, I don't know if you remember this, but there was, you know, it, it's a group of very successful business people from around the world. We were all coming together to explore conversation. It was a conversation between business and values. And then in the middle at one point in the evening, we threw in a curveball and we had this guest speaker who was completely knows nothing about business. And he's all about heart. His name was Arun Pat, Arun Dada, as we call him. 
And so here is this guy who has never sold his labor in his life, like ever. He has never transacted. Everything has been like mother's love. He says, I'm going to treat everyone the way my mother gave me love. That's how I'm going to serve. And he kind of had his family and all of that. But now imagine this contrasting with like the, the, the people who've had, uh, who come from a commercial world. And it's quite a contrast. And what struck me, Macon, um, and this to me stands out as the moment when I really felt your heart, I would say, is that after that talk, and I was translating uh, poorly uh, from his Hindi to English, <laughs> and there were many people checking. And at the end of that, a bunch of people gathered around and Macon comes up to him. He waits. He has a question. He's kind of engaged. And he waits all the way at the end. And he, you bow down, Macon, you bow down and touch his feet. Um, that means you saw in him someone who is very, comes from a very different world. He spent his whole life with Vinoba Bhave. Uh, you know, he, he served and you also served, but there was something you saw in him that you wanted to bow down to. Um, and I wonder if we can start there as your proper introduction of like, what, what made you want to do that? You know, I, I do you remember that moment? I, I you you had tears in your eyes and uh, you were very profoundly moved, it seemed like, but I didn't know uh, by what. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you for taking me back there. I think, uh, yeah, I was so deeply inspired by um, by not just his thoughts, but his actions, right? That how the life he had lived, uh, and the stories you told, the stories he told, and the simplicity with which uh, he answered the questions that a lot of us put with a lot of convoluted minds and hearts, uh, put, dishing out questions to him. And he was answering them with that same simple filters of how he's lived his life. Um, so for me, I think the the pieces that made me bow down were uh, about one, just, just the conviction and the action uh, being completely in harmony, right? That there being, there being no difference between what was being said and what was being done, right? What was being thought and what was being acted on. Um, and I have, um, like personally, that, that's been a journey for me. That's been a struggle. Uh, right, that it's it's easy to believe in something, but then to live it, to act it okay, in in small <laughs> moments. Uh, I think that's been that's been a journey, right? And I've faltered at many times. Uh, I think same thing with what you say, your words and your actions, and like what I felt uh, with Arundada was that that. There was just so much integrity, truth, power in everything that he had, that he would say and do. Um, yeah, so to me, like, I, I don't, I don't remember the bowing down or the tears, but like, for me, there was uh, a lot of, a lot of joy and respect in just meeting him and getting to know him. And he is so old and again, a lot of, uh, a lot of gratitude to you and to Service Space to have, I wouldn't have ever got a chance to speak to someone like him. Um, I remember uh, my question to him and I've quoted that answer to many, many people after that. Uh, so my question to him was um, that I have this struggle of uh, building an organization where I want to promote agency, uh, where people do what they, their inner calling is, what they believe in. But at the same time, and he stopped me right here, right? And he said, Sanstha mat chalao. Right? So it basically meant that like trying to build an organization, like trying to organize this idea of uh, enabling agency. And that clarity of thought that the moment there is an organization, it takes away agency. Mm -hmm. Right? That the organization's goals become larger than the individual's agency. Mm -hmm. uh, and that clarity of thought, like without even letting me finish my question. He knew what the root was. Um, and I've said this many, many times at Udyam, the organization I continue to run, uh, and to many other people that, hey, uh, by, by organizing ourselves, we are in some sense reducing agency. Yeah. 
Yeah, for sure. Well, thank you. And, and uh, you know, I ruined that, that one of the things he says is that when you introduce others, you're actually introducing yourself. And I think we can extend that to say when you bow down to others, you're bowing to that part in you. And I think that when you, I, you know, you honor and acknowledge somebody else being the change so deeply, so simply, uh, so like without any agenda, it's almost like that, that mirrors your own aspiration. And, and I think even that aspiration alone is something remarkable. So thank you. Uh, thank you for, for being on that path. I, I, would, I, I think all of us around you were moved by that. Um, and, and I think Arunda that was as well. And I think that's your, that's your character. So I, I want to take our arc um, and we will, I realized I didn't even mention Udyam, which we want to focus on actually, because that's a big thrust of who you are now. Um, but I want to start in your early years. Um, and I want to play uh, a little clip uh, to start us off here. This is from somebody you will recognize um, and someone who has known you for a long time as well. So here, here we go. Let's just play a short clip and then uh, I, I'll lead into my question. Megan and I go back 20 plus years. We met in college in 2001. Uh, we started seeing each other in college and we got married in 2005 after four years of knowing each other. Um, I can easily say that the number of triggers that he had, I mean, he used to be this angry young man. Like I would be scared of him because I would get nervous around, okay, if I say this, then maybe he'll get upset. If I say that, then I have to watch my words with him because... Um, but now it's absolutely zero. Like he, he doesn't get triggered. So I think he's come 360. I mean, he's come quite a distance from where he wow. was. Um, and that's again, something that I have a lot to uh, learn from him because <laughs> I'm at that stage where, oh my God, everything gets me upset. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, I've, I've literally, I like, I, I've started journaling myself that, okay, these are my observations through the day. I have to sit outside myself and see, okay, he said this at this time and why did it trigger me? Let me think about it. So I've, I've literally reached that stage, but I, I notice him and he just doesn't get like, he's very calm about his emotions. <laughs> um. <laughs> why am I surprised? <laughs> Well, we figured rather than just us ask, asking a question, let's go to a credible authority. Um, and, and she, you know, so here's here's my question to you from your formative years. Um, uh, you, you know, reach out your wife uh, who clearly uh, loves you and and thinks so highly of you, and, and she's saying that here was a man who's gone through this incredible transformation from like an angry young man to uh, somebody who's like in the middle of so many intense things and yet is able to just retain his composure. Um, I think no one at your work at Udyam has, uh, has, has said that they've seen you angry, you know? And so how, uh, w w t take us through that transformation. Like what, how, how, do, you, how do you change so radically? Uh, what inspired that and what uh, sustained that? Yeah, I, I feel as I reflect back, right, that um, I, I wouldn't lose uh, my cool or my ang or get angry with everyone. Uh, right? I, I think uh, Richa and my mom have possibly seen me most angry uh, as in they're, they're faced uh, my anger a lot, lot more than a lot of other people. But, um, and I, hence, in some sense, Rich has seen me very closely and seen that transformation uh, or seen that change happen. Um, yeah, I, I, I feel it started, um, it started around the time when we got married, um, right? And, um, the realization that, uh, as in, and after having known each other for over four years, we I thought I thought I knew her well, right? But then as she moved into uh, home, and we like um, we started living together, and there were there were realizations that there was just so much she had to change in her life, um, and didn't necessarily didn't necessarily think of it like think of 
how challenging, how difficult, uh, or was ever demanding about any of like, hey, wanting to do things in a certain way that she'd done earlier. Like just, just came in and like the visual in my head is like a, like a color flowing into water and then like just became one. Uh, and here I was who would, like she said, who would lose his temper at small things with simple triggers. Um, and I feel it was a lot of arrogance. Um, it was a lot of um, entitlement. Um, and I think just, just watching her, uh, living with her helped me, helped me see myself, helped me see my arrogance, entitlement, which by the way, like continued through a large part of say, for example, my Flipkart journey, uh, where I was, I was hardly home. Right. Uh, and it's like my, our daughter was six months old when I joined Flipkart. Um, uh, and then our son was born, uh, two years later. And like the amount of time I spent with my kids and wife, uh, during those six and a half, seven years, um, uh, is not forgivable. So it's, um, and, and, and she managed, she ran all of that with, uh, and it's not like we didn't fight or we didn't, we didn't complain to each other. We had all of that. There is enough masala in our life. Uh, right. But, uh, I think overall she continued to be this person who lives in the moment. Right. And, and I, I continue to be this person, uh, I, I think I've learned a little from her of uh, le living in the moment, but uh, it's visible. Like when the two of us are on a walk, uh, like every now and then I will be walking two steps ahead. Like I'm almost in a hurry to get somewhere all the time. Right. <laughs> and she is like, she's pulling me back. She's like, Hey, relax. Uh, right. So, so I think, um, I think watching her uh, and, seeing the kids grow up uh, were, were the larger were the larger pieces that helped me move from uh, move away from anger um, i feel like i said i was i was never angry or i don't think i ever got angry with even my college friends or otherwise so there isn't uh, people can't believe mekin getting into a fight and and krishnan laughs at what i call a fight uh, he's like, <laughs> like that's not a fight. Uh, so, so I think from a lot of those places, um, not a lot has changed. Uh, but personally, like with her, with my mom, uh, I think there is now just a lot of admiration, respect, and and a little bit of learning from them to live in the moment, uh, right, and not care so much about. Um, the judge within me uh, and like in some sense the judge within me has acted or has defined a lot of my early life uh, of what is right what is right here what is wrong um, and shut out some of my feelings uh, early on but I've learned to listen more to them thanks to Richa thanks to mom uh, and I think that's what's really calmed me down yeah well, that's, it, it, it's remarkable to hear you reflect because everyone around you that we have spoken to, many people that we have in common, uh, they're, uh, they, they look at you as like this iconic uh, symbol of equanimity. You know, that's there, you're, you're present. Even on our, you know, check-in call, you try to like, you know, include everybody. You said hello to every single person. Uh, that was there and, and it just seems like very, very natural to you. So I, I mean, the core essence of my question, and maybe we can go to the next bit of your journey, which was at Yahoo. You say, and you're at Yahoo trying to understand user behavior and trying to understand people. Um, and this is really a large part of understanding people. There's a data element, but there's also an element of how you understand your own self. Right? Um, and so I, I'm curious if you can reflect a little bit 
on because then you go on to become like chief people officer at Flipkart. So uh, clearly there's something in you that knows how to work with people that knows how to give the benefit of the doubt, that knows how to bring everyone together and synergize them. Uh, so I'm wondering if you can take us on an arc of like, what, do, what did you learn about people? Uh, maybe from the data analysis from your Yahoo days and maybe from your you know, team building uh, and, and how did that sort of evolve into your flip card days of people officer work as well? Yeah. It's so I, I find it again hard to place a finger at like was there one event that transformed me or changed uh, into this some of this thinking but um, I feel I've been um, yeah I I feel like starting from a place of trust has just come as a gift has just been natural uh, um, and I almost can't imagine uh, a different way even though I know there are different ways and I've um, I have encountered them and uh, discussed with uh, people around why like starting with trust just makes a lot more sense. But I think uh, I saw data bear a lot of that out. Um, so first, maybe the analytical side of understanding people, uh, right? what I learned from data, which is that something that surprised me very first time I saw it was that uh, people go with defaults. Right? Whatever is the most obvious thing that's available is what people is the path that people choose to walk on. And like I was doing, uh, I was doing analysis of data for um, for Yahoo Toolbar. So Toolbar is used to be these extensions that you add to your browser, and um, and the mere presence of the toolbar on somebody's browser would enable them or would nudge them towards using Yahoo a lot more. So as a business, that was a great piece. And I don't think we as a company were valuing what that meant to us because uh, there is there are things that people do on the toolbar that you can measure, but what they do off the toolbar and just because this is a reminder to them constantly, uh, it's there in their face all the time. Uh, what's the impact of that? Uh, so I studied that and the realization that, hey, reminders like this or just being there as default uh, drive a lot of human behavior. So that was one. But on the other extreme, I also found um, that Yahoo was then uh, supporting or partnering with a bunch of internet service providers. So we would get anonymized data of internet usage. Um, and I was interested in what do users love most, right? What do people love most on internet? Um, and back in 2003, uh, like the one website which had uh, usage off the charts was this website called neopets.com. Uh, and I was, I was like, I'd never heard of it. I didn't know what Neopets is. And uh, so I went in and tried to figure and it was basically a site for virtual pets right that you could own a virtual pet and then you had to take care of it you had to feed it you had to pet it uh, you had to listen to its grouses and uh, anger and so on and it had like over 500 page views per session that users would just stay on and keep coming back and so on one end you have you have people who are um, who are just doing whatever is put in front of them and then on the other end you also have people who are following this instinct of, hey, they want a virtual pet and like caring for it and like really uh, doing whatever it takes to make that virtual pet happy. Uh, and this back then was a lot more uh, Korean, Japanese uh, and the East Asian uh, users who would do this a lot more. But, but I think uh, to, me, these were, to me, these were examples of here is user agency. Like if they have a chance, they would, this is what users will want to spend time on. They would love to spend time with pets. They would love to take care of someone, uh, right? There is that innate need that people want to be serviced and Neopets is fulfilling that need for them. Right? And then here is what, what you would call the platform where, hey, whatever you offer to people, people will use and just do that, right? So, and I think it made me realize that there was uh, like technology was obviously a very powerful, 
uh, in being able to shape uh, and influence uh, user behavior. But at the same time, technology was also powerful in enabling a lot more agency, in enabling people to be able to do what they really wanted to do. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, I, I think those were the early pieces that I learned from. I think some other things I learned was that people, people's actions were driven more by their fear uh, than by their hopes. Uh, so the Neopets group was small and the other groups were larger. Um, at Flipkart, when we were uh, trying to figure out, um, so we had, we were this amazing book selling company uh, who had grown rapidly and then we launched our next category. So we launched mobile phones, uh, right? And this is at a time in India where uh, mobile phones are starting to take over and a lot of mobile phones are being sold. 2010, a little after 2010. Um, and three months after selling, after launching mobile phones, our mobile phone sales are nearly flat. Our book sales continue to rise, but we are just not able to sell mobile phones. Hardly anybody in India reads books, but we are able to sell books and almost everybody is starting to buy mobile phones and we are not able to sell mobile phones. And we're like, yeah, what's wrong? Matlab, this is something for which there is so much demand in the market and yet people aren't buying from us. And, and then we started introspecting and start talking to people and realized that um, book is a 300 rupee book. A phone is a even then was like a 5,000, 10,000 rupee phone. So there is just that marked difference in people's willingness to uh, take a risk with a mobile phone, right? Ordering something online, aayega, nahi aayega, uh, we don't know. And, and then as we start speaking to people, they start sharing that, hey, what if something's wrong with the phone? What do I do? If I buy it from a shop, I can go to the shop and ask the guy to fix it, right? But with Flipkart, what do I do? And we realized we hadn't thought about those pieces. And then we also realized that so, so based on a lot of this learning, we launched a 30-day replacement guarantee. A lot of people laughed at us that, oh, like India my 30-day replacement guarantee. Are you crazy? <laughs> well, uh, who does that kind of thing? Uh, we launched cash on delivery. Uh, we scaled cash on delivery. But if you, and I think in some sense, what we did in those three, four months, right? Understanding people that people were operating from a place of fear. If this is not right, what happens, right? So the, the fear of the unknown and if you could, and it was basically being able to solve for that fear is what Flipkart was able to do and then grow. But if I were to step back and generalize that, that I have seen a lot more people operate from a place of fear uh, than operate from a place of hope. Um, and I've had a very interesting relationship with fear. It's, uh, it's something I would fight with my mom about in like, um, in some of her actions, she would say that thoda dal zaruri hai. like a little bit fear is necessary, uh, right? You should be obedient and you should uh, do things because of fear uh, for, for your for your own good and for your own safety. And um, and especially with my sister, uh, so I have a younger sister, and uh, I'd be like, hey, what you're doing is causing fear, and she shouldn't operate from a place of fear. And this is when I was like seven or eight, and um, and we would have these fights and I think she grew to be uh, a far more fearless person despite uh, whatever mom was doing. So I, I, I don't know if uh, I have really understood fear, uh, but I've, as, I, as I grew up and I started exploring education and then I find, oh, Ravindranath Tagore has written about a place without fear and then Jiddu Krishnamurti has written about a place without fear and I'm like, oh, I was probably onto something, man. Uh, maybe I should delve more in this idea of like a fearless world, uh, right? And um, so, so yeah, I, 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 and I think the last piece was um, that, that people did, so I deeply believe that people do what they did whatever they feel is the best they can do at that moment, uh, right? That at any instant, any action that the user is taking, that the person is taking, an individual is taking, is their belief that this is the best option they have. Now, they might believe that because of constraints they have, because of stories they have told themselves, because of family, society, other pressures, good or bad, however you look at it, but they are doing, each individual at every moment is doing the best they think they can. This is a, I don't know, it's an operating belief I've held uh, and it's deep down. I don't know why I hold it, but it's just been there that everybody's trying to do their best. Yeah. Uh, 
and hence like if an action is not necessarily good for them or good for society or a positive action uh, it might hurt people it might hurt e- ecology economy etc i have gone back to like asking hey what were the conditions like what's the context like why what led the person to do this rather than the person doing x or y right that we are i think of each one of us as the products of our pasts our experiences have led us to where we are and that's what is leading us to do what we are doing right now yeah. uh, it's not so and again there is this mix of there is a little bit of our own agency but there is a lot more of our context uh, no that's it. that's inspiring you, you know there there's a quote that says uh, you know be kind because everyone is uh fighting their own fight um as in everyone is going through that and even if you don't know it if you just lead with that idea that look man it seem it you know they're probably going through a lot of other stuff in their own context that i don't know about and maybe this is why they show up at work and today they're not in their best you know and if you can just give that benefit of the doubt which is what it seems like you're sharing um then i think you can you know you can you can get you can not only get a lot done but it's actually a lot more meaningful right it's a, it has a lot more purpose it yeah. satisfies in a different way right yeah it's it's also uh it so there is like when you start with that like what then happens is co-creation what then happens is often a lot more beautiful right because you if if you're willing to take that first step to try and understand that hey what's happening and why are you doing this uh, yeah. the other person opens up and um, so i have a interesting story from tripkart early days um, there is a so this is i think on a monday uh, 2010 um, prarabh who was the first intern at flipkart uh, walks up to me and says that i can uh, that our our website on the mobile phone just sucks uh, and i'm taken aback i'm the head of engineering uh, i feel responsible for it and this is an intern who's just joined the company like uh, less than a month back and uh, like okay uh, but i take a deep breath and i'm like okay like why do you say that and then he shows it to me that you have to do pinch and zoom to be able to see you try and click something it you click the wrong link because uh it just doesn't work well and, and like sure i get it but so what and i'm like how many people even use the mobile website um so we end that conversation and uh, i am a little angry inside probably uh, but uh, i've but at that moment i like i realized that um like a day later uh, i go back to him and ask him that how huh, what do you want to do about it? uh he's like i don't know and then uh, the next weekend he's worked on the mobile website uh, created a completely brand new version uh working uh, at a friend's house tapas's house and then in on monday he's like hey megan we have a new mobile website wow. uh wow and i feel like just i i think i actually did almost nothing and that's probably the right thing right that had i had i acted uh, to the impulse that hey here somebody uh, telling you something that's not right about one of your creations uh, right? uh, and uh, had i shut that down maybe he may not have created it but that's probably the only thing i do i did which is to not react to not uh, but otherwise it was just his agency is like hey i want to fix this it's his pain yeah. that he went on to serve um, yeah. so i i think i think if people feel like uh that you trust them that it's okay for them to be themselves um they will they go on to do things which are far beyond what you can ask people to do yeah uh, right so and, and i think at flipkart there were like uh, like hundreds of stories like this yeah. where all that was happening was basically people taking ownership and responsibility and initiative that no no i don't like what we are doing here and i want it to be better because i but, but it's a different kind of leadership right it's not a leadership that says 
I'm the boss, you will, I have the vision and you will implement what I have in mind. It's almost like you're letting go of that control and you're, you're, you're trusting in the group a lot more than your individual capacities. And, and I think that takes a lot as a, as a leader to do. Um, and maybe, maybe. Uh, so maybe it comes very naturally to you. And you're like, oh, it doesn't take a lot. It's just common sense. Uh, and no, everybody think, does win with that. See, I think you are saying, you are saying I do this well. And then I compare this with what Arundhada is saying. And I'm like, I'm far away, dude. <laughs> Like, I don't know what you mean. There's always a higher benchmark. There's always exactly, a higher that, benchmark. Hey, that, yes, uh, there is. Uh, and and this, is, this is something we try and do out of them. And autonomy and agency continues to be like the most popular topic at our all hands. Uh, right? That, hey, how much do individuals do? And then uh, what about strategy? And how do, you, how do you go towards a path that we are wanting to go to? Yeah. And... I feel, yes, compared to most organizations and most of the corporate world, uh, I'd say that, yes, I've probably done better. Uh, and uh, like working with people comes a lot more naturally to me. And uh, it's been easier for people to do what they are capable of. Um, but I still think there is a long way for, uh, for me or for us um, in organizations as a society to be able to like really enable what people are, what their true potential is. Uh, there's just so much uh, sitting there, so much potential lying there and it, it gets shut down by so many activities, so much action that we do. Well, and potential, I think, is an interesting segue into the next part because you actually, so you were doing so good, you were happy, you, you probably were having so much impact at Flipkart but you felt like maybe you weren't, this wasn't your highest potential or maybe this wasn't your, your deepest calling. Uh, can you take us briefly through that process that let you, that, you know, if, if from, a, from an onlooker's point of view, you're like, man, this guy's got a dream, dream life and dream situation. And you're like, no, wait a second. I want to go and serve. And you're, you were still, you are still pretty young. So uh, w what goes on in your mind that flips that switch from like this unending rat race to actually going the other way? Yeah, I, I think uh, just so before I start on that story, just a couple of pieces on just backtracking, right? I, I don't think I ever got fully enamored by um, any one goal. Uh, right, and that it's not that I have to be rich. It's not that I have to reach X or so. There, have, there hasn't necessarily been a goal that I've been running my life with. Or it's there has been a lot of what we at Service Space called emergence. Right, that oh, uh, like the decision to join Pesit instead of RV as a college when I had the option. The decision to uh, leave Yahoo, uh, join a startup then a decision to join Flipkart. I think all of these are, have been decisions that have, um, that have felt right in the moment uh, and not necessarily from a, from a destination point of view, that this is where I want to get to and hence this is the path. Uh, so I, so that's, that's just been the decision-making process, uh, so to say. And in that same process, um, there was this incident in a... There were 10 of us, uh, Sachin had famously called us the Flipkart think tank, uh, trying to think about uh, what, should, what should Flipkart strategy be for the next 10 years. Um, in some sense, like I often joke and laugh that, hey, here is a seven-year-old company trying to think about next 10 years. Abhi, saal ki to hui nahi hai. Like you're not even 10 years and you're trying to think 10 years later. But well, uh, we all with full ownership participated in their exercise. And um, one, of the, one of the 10 is an ex-consultant and uh, took us through a visioning exercise, which is like, hey, what does the world look like 10 years from today? What does Flipkart look like 10 years from today? And what do you look like 10 years from today? And for me, that was like a super jarring exercise because I just could not, I tried very hard uh, to see myself at Flipkart and I just couldn't. Um, and it was very jarring because this was a company that I felt like I'd like I'd grown up with. I'd I'd brought up like uh, I would like Richard would call it like my first child, right? The 
the other two kids that we've had, uh, I'd spent far less time with them than I had with Flipkart. I'd given a lot more to it. And yet I couldn't see myself with this entity 10 years from today. Um, and that left me very unnerved. Um, I didn't know why was it happening, but I just couldn't see myself. And and maybe for for a moment, I was some of the some of the myths and stories dropped and I could just see this truth that no, this is not me. Um, and I think a couple of months of then exploring or figuring out like, hey, then if this is not me, then who am I? And uh, what do I really care about? What should I be doing, et cetera? Led me to a path that, okay, let's get out of Flipkart and then start exploring and figuring out and thinking. Um, and, and again, Nipun, the, for me, the idea of service or seva as we call it is it isn't with the destination or the intention of uh, serving that I got into what I'm doing now or what I started over the last five years. I was actually still being very selfish and uh, continue to be selfish and thinking about what gives me joy, right? So I, the question I was asking myself was like, as in who am I? And it's again, very self-centered and thinking about, so the realization that I got joy out of like things with people, right? So whether it's the move from or thinking so much about the technology team rather than the technology that we were building or the move to chief people officer or the different people stories that I really, really love. Um, so, and when I look back, even at Yahoo, like understanding people really. So, so people give me joy. And within that, like people succeeding, people reaching their potential, people doing things that's unexpected of them. And especially where it's unexpected, where it's the underdog that really does well. And I think a lot of us would relate to the underdog excelling movies. Where, uh, hey, you have a story where the underdog comes out and then fights hard and then wins. Uh, and I feel it's a very human emotion that all of us get joy out of it. I just, in some sense, was able to relate to it and anchor myself to it a lot more. Um, so I, I think then the decision that, hey, if, if people's success gives you joy, then to me, education was obvious that, oh, that's where my definition of education is, how do, how do you enable people to succeed? Yeah, this is it. You know, Dalai Lama has a quote that we often use in service space. It's, uh, it's called, be selfish, be generous. Mm -hmm. That and, and if you, you know, it's like it's in other people's yeah. success that you actually can find so much joy. Absolutely. And if you have not experienced that, then you're actually missing out. It's like not having tried a certain flavor of ice cream and you're like, oh, my God, try it, dude. It's amazing. Right. And so um, and, and but you're talking about education and this is really the core of a good teacher because a teacher kind of does that. And, and we want to I want to transition to that. And I want to invite Swara. Uh, to pick, pick your brain a little bit around uh, education and with them. But uh, before that, um, we, I want to have a little clip here. Uh, this, is, this is somebody making really um, admires uh, somebody who has taught him a lot about uh, working with people. Um, and so let's just take a look and see what he has to say. This is, uh, this is um, of course, Macon will know. This is somebody who's quite accomplished in, in uh, the corporate world as well, Bharat Vijay. Macon has been the kind of person you always wish you can emulate. Um, keeps things simple and always cooperative in his approach. Uh, his sense of competition is to just raise his own level of excellence. Um, I remember we were on multiple occasions where we had our backs to the wall and, uh, you know, Mekin is just naturally brilliant, also hardworking and also the kind of person who can rally others and lift them. Uh, whether it was in Yahoo or in Eugenie, I, I noticed that, you know, in both the cases, um, he's the person around which uh, a lot of good things happen. Um, always ready to take the initiative to organize um, and, uh, and, and to bring people together 
um, and in in all causes i think sometimes uh, there was an occasion where yahoo was actually doing not the best thing for its customers and uh, we worked together on a on a project that was unpopular with the management in yahoo but eventually convinced them to do better by their own customers um and and making carries that that inner um inner desire to to help others to organize to use his intelligence to um to help more people i think that's just so natural natural to him um and he doesn't let any personal setbacks come in his way and he tries to take everybody with him wow well wow. i mean it, it, <laughs> thank you just, just thank you <laughs> no, no, but like he's um he was my first manager um at yahoo and i i feel blessed and uh, it's funny what he said that good things seem to happen around mekin and i like i cannot understand why life has been so kind to me like like to have someone like bharat as your first manager like what did i do to deserve that i don't know but uh, to get lucky with people like him uh, who would care so deeply about like all all 50 of us to know uh, know our personal lives our work uh, unblock us like again be like fully present whenever they were they were with us uh, right so so to have experienced that and then uh, so there's a small story to me leaving flipkart uh, which connects bharat um, so we hadn't spoken i eugenie uh, we were we, bharat was still involved but after i joined flipkart been about 6 7 years we hadn't spoken for a long while and i had gone through this introspection journey and there is this morning where i've set up time with sachin to go tell him that hey i'm done uh, my meeting is at 11 at 9 i get a call from a us number uh, and uh, i was nervous about my meeting with sachin so i'm early at work and i i planned the whole conversation a lot and so on but uh, i pick up that call and it's bharat uh, and i'm like hey bharat long time how have you been uh, he asked me can i am okay but uh, are you okay i can he asked it in such a knowing way where he's like uh, i'm like and i tell him that yeah i'm okay but here is what i'm planning to do at 11 o'clock and this is he's like yeah i felt something was something was uh brewing minding me some something was brewing and he felt it sitting there in the bay area wow. and like he reached out and then we had a all long conversation uh and hence i had the extra job of convincing my first mentor of what i was doing was right and thankfully <laughs> he's been like 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 my dad my wife my mother he has been just so supportive of um of things they've questioned me but they've they've been really supportive of what i have uh, what i'm trying to do and why i am trying to do it in um uh, Yeah so <laughs> and, and in his synthesis he is saying man it's not just that good things happen around you but that you bring everybody along with you and he says you you had it in you and and i think for a teacher in some sense the best gift is that the student pays it forward you know so if he's your mentor he was your first mentor he whatever he gave you and he, and you're then like now dedicating your life to sort of passing it on what you just shared even before that clip is to find the joy in helping other people succeed right we 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 know the kind of a certain there's a certain kind of low ceiling to a joy that you feel when you succeed yourself and and it's good there is some amount of joy to it but the kind of joy you feel when others succeed because of what you have done for them is just like uncomparable and that i think is the core as you said of education and my introduction to you even before i met you was actually someone who was on this call swara and she comes from that education world and she's like man this guy did something amazing he went from like flipkart to just like diving deep into the world of education and so sorry i want to i i want to invite you to kind of uh 
see if uh, you can you can ask him a tough question or some mm. you know see see where we go with the education yeah. bit because yes. that's a passion for him and it's a passion for you as well absolutely absolutely i have been enjoying this conversation so much and mekin so uh, you know when i hear all this uh, the flip card and technology story and you join education so our gain their loss is what i see if i consider myself from the education world but i care for education and um, i i have been trying i have been trying to understand different things and uh, from like and there is just so much right like you and you 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 spoke to almost 100 people right like a bunch of books and all and i was like why didn't i think about that or i want to at least find out what you learned from your journey but like uh, you know experiments which are like um, i don't know if you've heard of chaitanya bai but he's a gandian and he uh, he's actually the grand uh, so arundhati's grand uncle of chaitanya bai he lives in this small village he's committed were there from last 40 years works with a very small group of children and from whatever he has so uh, like when they did not have a dorm for boys what actually they did and i i went up on their dorm they actually built a dorm on a tree and the boys would live there and the classroom would turn into a space for girls to stay in the night so just simple but very deep experiments right to people like you uh, shaheen right efi or uh, they've been like impacting uh, government schools and everything has a space and I value the whole spectrum. And I wish I could have done like uh, the pilgrimage of education that you did meeting everyone. So here is uh, my golden chance to ask you the question, what did you learn from there? And, uh, you know, if you could share, you know, some highlights, some learning, some story, which stood out for you in your journey. Sure, sure. No, Swara, I uh... Again, I have a lot of respect for just the way you the way you approach learning, right? And the way you think about and you narrate stories about students and um, and mostly through Krishnan. But uh, but yeah, I, I'm 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 just happy and glad and honored to be to be answering this. Um, yeah, I think the uh, for me, the first realization or the first whack on my head was uh, reading the Asa report. Right? The, and again, as an engineer and having lived in the world of data, that came naturally to me. I'm like, okay, I have to get into education. Let's try and understand education with data. Uh, I read the Asa report and I knew nothing. Right? I'm like, I didn't know that, hey, so many schools had gotten built, that we had so much enrollment, uh, that our learning levels were so far behind. So. I had absolutely no clue. Any number that from that report you would ask me to guess, I would have been wrong by more than 70%. Right? So that's a, that was a, a realization that, okay, yes, you may have grown up in these five, six small towns and uh, have studied in seven schools, but you really don't understand education in India. Um, so I think that's where the decision to... Uh, I'm not going to jump in. I'm going to spend time learning. Uh, got made, um, and and I had this impatience about trying to create impact fast. Right? I want to create the largest impact fastest. Uh, simple, uh, right? But uh, and I didn't know where to start. But I was so I would go in and start talking to people uh, that who I thought were working in education. So right from the Montessori principal for our kids to. Uh, and then ask each one of them, who did they think was the two or three people that I should talk to, right? And that network just kept building. Like people were kind enough to both, and then I would follow it up. Acha, introduce kar doge kya, please. Uh, and they would connect me. So, uh, and it's like, our conversation would start with, hey, tell me whatever you would want to tell me about education, right? And, and people would initially be taken aback. They're like, yeah, acha. As in, what do you mean education? Education is so vast, the spectrum that you just talked about or Montessori to high school. But I feel, again, just so much kindness that people shared uh, in those conversations. Um, I remember my trip to Ahmedabad with uh, Sridhar sir uh, of EI. Right? I would, uh, the way he would, uh, the way he would simplify things and put things in perspective, both from his experience of running uh, Eklavya, uh, the school, and then his experience of running EI. And he could talk to the engineer in me. Like he, like he would explain that, 
लेकिन एजुकेशन इज वेयर मेडिसिन वॉज हंड्रेड इयर्स अगो राइट कि पांच दवाई है वट एवर द सिम्टम वी विल गिव जस्ट गिव यू वन ऑफ दिस राइट वी डोंट हैव एनीथिंग एल्स वी डोंट हैव एनी डायग्नोसिस we don't have so he could explain education to me like i would understand it um, that this is the current state uh, so i i think besides the so a few things that i realized right that one there were enough there was enough brilliant work happening in education uh, but two and the sad part was that it was not it was not getting emulated it was not getting uh, captured it was not growing uh right despite people's efforts so there were islands of brilliance or oases of excellence lekin by and large the experience for most learners was that of a desert um right where there was very very little nurturing happening very little growth happening and and again as somebody who's who's thought about scale right from first my first job Uh, I was pulled towards कि ये क्यों हो रहा है like why is this happening and what is the system behind it and and I was clear that it's not that somebody wants I feel like almost nobody in education wants the learners to have the sterile experience that they do right but it still is so despite the good intentions of a lot of people that work in education most teachers I know are amazing people and yet the experience that the learners have is not great uh, so so in trying to understand that I i figured that hey there are a few uh, there are a few deep rooted causes to why things are the way they are that one is that we have imagined learning to be a bucket to be filled and not for learners to be learners to be inspired um there is something that tells the system that the system knows better than the learner right and hence there is immense hierarchy in the system that oh somebody sitting in scrt will dream up with what the curriculum should be right and i think the first time we we were writing curriculum uh, in delhi i would go do ab tests right and the minister mr sisodia got to know of them and he's like hey i have never heard of ab tests for curriculum like this has to be the most scientifically built curriculum ever uh, because curriculum is just written by experts like the expert is supposed to know what is right for the learners and you but to me that's just it's just arrogance and hierarchy that you believe that you know better than the learner versus actually ab testing which is non hierarchical where you let the learner tell you hey what's right or what works so so i think there was uh, this piece about hierarchy and uh, not listening to the learner or learner having no choice or no agency in learning was another one and then finally was this our learning was so disconnected from the real world um, and one of the person who deeply inspired me in this journey dr rajaram kudli he said this very brilliantly that we have no shame in teaching our kids z for zebra we can't even find another word to start from z knowing fully well that 99.9% kids will never see a zebra in their life so they just have to visually imagine that oh there is this horse like animal with white and black stripes which seems it seems somewhat unnatural and artificial it's so beautiful but uh, it and right from there education just goes on in the virtual world like the learner loses any chance of questioning anything that they are being taught right that oh teacher ne bola hai and then the teachers also then perpetrate that that hey this is how it is written in the textbook please don't ask me right this is what it is just take it and believe it so i feel like these were in some sense uh, some of the things that i learned uh, and then yeah i i started in my own my own way of like okay how could some of this be areas we work on and we trying to change with what we do out of them uh nikin i have uh, uh, at least two more questions for now one is that uh, so when you see that you know there are these voices of uh, excellence which are there and um, uh, the cross pollination of learning which doesn't happen is there something where you see uh, an opportunity that you know how would how, is there a possibility and uh, the second thing was that um, the experiments are i think it's related to this question that the experiments right like when we were talking earlier that, uh, that there are fewer schools right like the the jay krishnamurthy schools but uh, the learning does not get uh, kind of uh, you, you don't see the scaling of that learning which happens or uh, uh, more schools are not able to adopt those ideas right 
So what do you think? Where Where is it uh, that while intentions are in place, people are there, teachers are there, uh, yeah. but yet, you know, things don't kind of get uh, cross-pollinated that or adopted that easily. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and, and I think here, I feel like we have a lot to learn from uh, the for-profit or the business world uh, in terms of how that world leads uh, towards change uh, and towards learning from each other and doing whatever is working, right? And not necessarily looking at, uh, hey, my way is the only way. So uh, I feel some reasons are that uh, that they, when you see something else happening uh, and you see, oh, something is nice and brilliant, but you continue to believe that your path is, be is better, right? That you know the answer. Uh, so the the unwillingness to learn, and I uh, I joke that our education system does not learn. Uh, the unwillingness to learn uh, is is coming from our own mental models of what is right or what should what's the purpose of education. And it's actually funny. Like in my journey, I wrote about three blog posts trying to figure out what is the purpose of education, and I don't think we have alignment on it. Right. Uh, you like, like if you were to ask 20, 30, maybe 50 educationists, you might actually get 15, 20 different answers around what is the purpose of education. And if, if the goals are different, then paths will, people will choose their own paths. So that's one. I think second, mostly from the development sector and change makers side, right? Um, when we talk about our stories and let's say when, uh, and uh, frankly, I have struggled to finish Jiddu Krishnamurti's books, right? Uh, they, are, they are extremely deep, very meaningful. I love the thought process, but boy, it's a pain. Uh, right. So, and, and I think therein lies one of the pieces about like driving large scale change that again, for the learner, right? Say for another school or another educationist, you have to be willing to step into their shoes Right? and see world from their lens and then talk to them. So like uh, how a marketeer conveys the message in a way which is appealing to the learner, to the user, that huh, this is what would work versus preaching from high towers that this is the right way of doing things. And I feel that way about a lot of change. Um, and I'll use a simple example that I feel we've gotten lucky with, with Udyam is that We've tried to package what we do, right? Like we work on building agency uh, through self-awareness, self-belief, grit, independence and experimentation. Um, but we've packaged it as the entrepreneurial mindset, right? So one, it does not remain abstract. You can start to visualize it that, oh, entrepreneurial mindset is not some psychological term like self-efficacy that only people who know Albert Bandura will understand. But it is something like entrepreneurial mindset, ki entrepreneur log kaise karte? That is what we're talking about. But secondly, you realize, like for us, the government and the politicians are key stakeholders. And if I look at it from their lens, I don't know if they are inspired by kids learning 21st century skills, but they are a lot more inspired by kids becoming entrepreneurs or entrepreneurial, right? They can visualize this. And so suddenly the connect uh, for, hey, what you're trying to do becomes that much easier. I think this we've seen happen through, so it's not so much that the bureaucrats don't want the change or the politicians don't want the change. It's just that they have to understand it in, in their heads. We can't, like whatever understanding Jiddu Krishnamurti might have had in his head, which he's translated into those big books, uh, actually thin books, but still very big books. <laughs> uh, right? It's still very, very hard for most people to understand and get and to be able to implement. So I feel like that's the reason why uh, this does not scale. And second is just markets that our goals are probably not aligned. Um, and yeah, uh, I, I can do a I can do a longer and more convoluted answer, Swara. But I'll just stop here. <laughs> no, it's great, and that was a great window into into that. Uh, but making I, I want to reflect a little bit on this idea of scale. I think everyone I've talked to that knows you says. One of the things Macon is always designing for is scale. 
Um, and it's understandable, big heart, you want maximum number of people to benefit, right? Uh, but I, I wanna bring in a couple of threads that you have mentioned to see how it kind of comes together. Um, so what, one thing you had shared uh, in an earlier conversation, you had spoken about open toys, uh, where a creator is creating something where there's openness to design for its users. And so something entirely unpredictable comes out of it. And so m where my mind is going is how do we create open schools in that same sense? Yeah. Uh, but I want to link it back to what you said uh, of what you quote uh, Arundada as saying, He's like, hey, don't do a sunsta. So my question is uh, around scale and what is scale without sunsta? Scale with sunsta, we already kind of know that we have the McDonald's of the world. And you, know, you, can, you can say they provide value, but you can just as easily say that they actually strip away a lot of value and externalize a lot of problems in society. So in this context of open schools, uh, how open can you actually make it? So you, can, you are scaling in a way without Sansta uh, or that you scale with Sansta in a way that Sansta can actually become irrelevant over time. And it you know, just kind of scales out. I, I, I don't know if you've put these things together, uh, but I, I actually tend to think that this is probably what an agile school would look like as well. That a school that adapts, right? We use that word in the, I, I say we, I like it. I'm like, we in the corporate world, I have had zero experience. Uh, but, you know, the, the corporate world uses agile all the time. And, and so how do you be fluid? And so you're not just like doing medicine from 100 years ago, kind of in our current schools. So I mean, that's, that's a whole lot of concepts there. But I'm wondering if you can uh, reflect a little bit on, on scale in a way that isn't just about a kind of subtle greed for more and more impact, doing it faster and faster, making my organization bigger and bigger uh, and, and the kind of externalities that creates. Like how, how, how do you process scale? Yeah, so, so Nipun, um, I'll take a couple of steps back and first just um, maybe arrive at it from a narrow lens that I know well and I can possibly maybe even communicate and then open up to, I think the very interesting space you've tried to create in terms of how do we imagine this. So first um, in, the, in the technology world, there is often a debate between what is a product and what is a platform, right? And um, in my head, and I like we would discuss this often at Flipkart was that a product is that has like a, very controlled and finite user experience. Where So the McDonald's is a perfect example of the McVeggie burger is a product, right? That it will be the same thing regardless of where you order it and so on. So, uh, so that's, uh, that's very finite and controlled. Your experience will not change, right? Okay. Um, and you compare that with a salad bar, right? Or you compare that with like, oh, you have a buffet and now suddenly you can go and pick and choose, like you want more of something, you want less of something. And that to me is a lot closer to a platform. Right? That, and in a platform, a few things happen that one, uh, the user's choice and agency starts playing a role. Right? And what, uh, what they should be doing. Uh, and, and I think this co-creation that, hey, the user brings in, makes the platform and the result of the platform far more interesting. So I'll, I think, and I feel like some of the best platforms or the, forget best, but the most widely plat used platforms, whether it's Facebook or Instagram or WhatsApp have basically done this. Like Facebook is nothing without its users, right? Or Instagram has absolutely no use without people actually doing things. So unless someone does something, Instagram is useless. But if, like the experience on Instagram is powerful because people are participating, because people are doing something. Uh, and I feel like if, if we could up the level of engagement and participation of what would, uh, like what would learners want the school to be, right? Like right now they have almost zero voice and zero choice. And uh, like if we could stay, start from, and there is actually, there is a movement called open schools. Uh, and there is, there are, there's also a movement called democratic schools. Uh, I think a bunch of schools in India are part of that movement where 
students get to decide a lot about what the learning might be. Right? But uh, I feel so. So I'll pause this thought here. I'll create. Okay. Yeah. So I, the, let me ask a counter question here. You. You may. So if you think of WhatsApp or Facebook or Instagram as a platform, and you say, "Hey, that allows for a lot of emergent things to happen." That's true, but it's also true that there's a big boundary around it, right? That there's actually, it's not truly emergent. It's actually emergent in a way that makes the platform a fair amount of money. And we have, we have example after example of how it has destroyed culture. So in some sense, this is where I was trying to go with the Arundada insight. So I'll come there is that. a scale, you, you know, you can say that like that WhatsApp is like the or Instagram or even Google, there are like amazing open toys that have created amazing open schools where many to many are interacting, but there are boundaries to that. And moreover, those are very commercial boundaries. Uh, and that starts to frame its users as consumers. Um, and so I'm thinking if we can imagine a space. Uh, and if we can imagine designers, particularly, even before you get to the space, you need the designers who can actually imagine what it would be like to scale without those boundaries. Like in a very concrete way, Facebook does not want me and you to hug in person, even if we were not in pandemic times. They would rather have us exchange virtual hugs that they can monetize because those are their boundaries. That's what that's and what that's about. a silly example in a way, but this is a, but those design constraints of our platforms because we're so addicted to our brands ends up actually really degenerating the platforms. And so from so, that 5,000 year view, and if you truly are just looking to help others succeed in some sense, if that's where your joy is coming, how, how, how do you, you know, how, how do you hold scale in that way? Because I, I, I know very few examples of scale within organizations that I can be like, oh, yeah, they did it right. You know, like, I don't think Facebook has done it right. I don't think any of the tech players have really done it right. You know, so let's start with one that we can quickly agree to has done it right. Right. Uh, Wikipedia. Right. Um, it is a nonprofit. Uh, massive scale. Right. And the level of engagement, right, both from the users who are creating uh, and the users who are uh, who are using that, right? So to imagine, like collectively, we could create and assemble this kind of a knowledge repository, uh, which otherwise was left to experts, uh, right? Has so so the kind of democratization that that has led to, and I think the way the organization is designed, right, is equally exemplary. So yeah. so Wikipedia, Signal, these are the right now the two. Uh, at scale B2C platforms run by nonprofits. Uh, and I think the profit motive is a is an interesting one. And I'm I'm still not at a stage where uh, my mind is completely made up that uh, it's it's the wrong thing. I do know that it is the wrong thing at scale, but I don't know if that is the wrong thing at start. Like uh, I've had Madhav Chavan, the founder of Pratham, talk to me about. Like, in, like limited greed is probably a good thing, right? <laughs> the challenge is with the limit going away, right? And, and we are just uh, reacting to uh, the Chinese government talking about making all its edtechs non-profit, right? To me, it feels like a knee-jerk reaction of exactly what we were discussing. So what if Facebook were a non-profit, uh, right? And then what would, it, what would it be intention to do? Uh, and I think it talks to, uh, at a very base level, uh, human aspirations of what are people willing to do? What are people wanting to do, right? And, and I feel like if, if we can figure out and marry the intentions of like people wanting to solve hard problems, to have personal gains, to have better lives, to have more fulfilling lives, along with things that do good, not just to the end, but also the means, right? That I feel then you start, uh, then you start having, having a balance that's probably a lot better. So, so I know like we live in a world where ends are more important than means. We were together sharing space in Gandhi 3.0 where like Gandhi clearly said means are far more important than end, that I would sacrifice ends uh, over means, uh, right? So, 
and i almost see this as like a seesaw to me like right now intuitively it feels like hey can we uh, can we try and approach balance right that if neither of them were bigger than the other right if the if the means are as important as the end and the end is as important as the means right so it's not trying to make one up over the other but we have to have both right so so it is possibly a harder problem that how do we arrive at how do we arrive at an open platform a large scale platform and yet something that's not doing disservice to the people who are creating it or its context right so it's something that's good for the individual the other and the context um i feel if we can do that uh, that's probably the the principles on which you could build uh, a large scale open school yeah it, it, and this is a, maybe a question uh, for a, a, a making 2.0 conversation here but I, i i feel like with your knowledge about people right and uh, what you were sharing earlier it points to intrinsic motivators and if you look at wikipedia as an example on wikipedia alone 100 million volunteer hours have been contributed so it's their ngo structure is not really the story the it, a it's a thin structure but b it's how what what technologies did they create that liberated 100 million volunteer hours that nobody saw even nobody even realized was right there in the making and people like clay sharkey who study the internet have spoken about how that's just 1% of what's possible now with the internet right and so but no one is utilizing uh, these tools and designing for intrinsic motivators and i feel like what you were doing as chief people officer was actually tapping into that you know and i think what you're doing in education is probably igniting some of that and i wonder how if you marry that flip card platform design thinking with uh, this kind of a thinking i wonder what would come out uh, in terms of scale i mean we know the internet itself right the way tim berners lee designed it is a completely open it, it would not be what it is Without. if it wasn't uh, designed as an open platform i mean linux apache you can go down the list of volunteer run intrinsically motivated uh you know projects uh that ended up changing the course of how we do life these days so i i find that to be an interesting question but maybe that's just me so i'm going to give it over to swara because we want to do a little bit of rapid fire okay no no more heady questions we're going to go and say okay quick uh, we're quick questions and see if you can give a quick response back um and, and and then we'll like uh, we we have a little surprise to close it out but swara over to you to see if we can uh we can do some rapid fire q and a with making awesome so uh, making are you ready for like a q and a i don't think i can get ready but let's go <laughs> okay 30 seconds and you have to answer the questions no thank you let's see give you try it out for the first time but okay let's go for it so uh what does make and make mean i've heard it like i just know one person who has this name so what does that name name mean meekin uh, you call my name you are my relative oh you making oh that's right amazing amazing beautiful okay second one uh your favorite sports hero rahul dravid wonderful okay your most memorable failure I think shutting down flight, uh, the music app at Flipkart. Uh, in Mahabharat, uh, you relate most to Gandhari. Why is that? I think I um, I feel like using all my powers is often unfair, and hence I try to shut down my powers uh, to operate in a world which I be- I make believe or. the story i tell myself is that that's probably a fairer world uh a book you would recommend to anyone toto chan uh one thing you don't like about and ent- we know what you like about entrepreneurs entrepreneurship one thing you don't like about it i think the unlimited greed okay um Uh, what's the biggest lesson your wife has taught you we heard a few in the beginning but yeah you have to say one being in the moment being in the moment yeah um uh, 
an act of kindness you won't forget i think so goes back to her um first first job interview at campus uh, infosys was in campus and i i didn't make it the results were out at 8 pm her college her hostel curfew was 7 pm she broke the hostel curfew rule stayed back uh, and this is even before we were seeing each other uh, mm. and and like after the results are out i am all dejected and broken and she's like let's just go for a ride right and, and we had like a silent bike ride for about uh, 45 minutes no words exchanged um yeah i feel that was probably the biggest act of kindness i have experienced personally this is so nice thank you for saying such a nice story okay uh, one thing which uh, you are currently working on uh, on learning oh so tennis and sanskrit uh, no on learning your uh, something that you are trying to unlearn learning. Oh, right. yeah. Although tennis and Sanskrit is interesting too, so you're yeah. learning tennis and Sanskrit. Learning, yeah. yes. I, I'm trying to learn Sanskrit. Um, I, okay, what am I trying to unlearn? I, yeah, I think a a lot of uh, a lot of things from the corporate world on 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 like uh, just goal driven ways of doing things. Uh, right so so balancing goals and principles and figuring so there are a lot of things from the corporate world which we get into regular questioning uh, and i'm lucky that there are whole bunch of people at udyam who participate in uh, active questioning of uh, hey but why are we doing this and what does it lead to and what does it really mean what do we intend to uh, allowing us to uh, yeah like question a lot of my beliefs on how an organization how the sanstha should be run mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. okay uh, which entrepreneur do you respect the most if it's one it's vergis kurian okay so uh, it's i think what he, yeah i i feel like what he did with amul and how he is mm-hmm. uh, his books uh, easily amongst the most inspiring if i could add another one it is infinite vision uh, dr v of arvind i care Uh, those are those are entrepreneurs i respect the most that's from my end but why do you have some more questions to ask oh and you did so well i i i would have a lot of questions but i i we're we're good that was good yeah i i i'll i'll hand it back to you swara it was great it's so joyous to kind of just you know get a small unfiltered from the heart glimpse yes 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 um <laughs> Yeah so Megan thank you so much for you know taking this time and you know sharing uh, so many nuggets from your life and uh, just uh, you know with all of us here and uh, I felt so encouraged to ask you you know something which would be so simple and uh, just you know taking it on sharing it uh, sharing your learnings everything and it's uh, I think uh, there is uh, somebody else also who kind of uh, you know Uh, things like that about you and we would like to share uh, another surprise a little surprise yes, with you indeed. uh so our last theme here is something that's actually near and dear to uh makin's uh, personality and i think all of us as well and and that is that is generosity that is giving and so we asked somebody who knows makin pretty well and uh they shared uh this story here um let's play this So uh this was when he was 4 years old i guess 3 or 4 years old and i was just one or two not that i remember of this but then because this has been talked about in the family when we meet so that's what i remember that uh, he'd gone with my nana ji to the shop and uh, he was offered a chocolate a candy and then uh, he says uh, where is the other one and nana ji like what is the other one for Like for my little sister, <laughs> so he's always been that. Uh, I mean, he's always been the giving one, and I was always the demanding one. <laughs> and I remember another one that we shifted to a new house, and so this was a. Uh, I mean, we. He must have told you that uh, dad had a transferable job. We had a new house, new uh, friends every three years. 
so we shifted into a new house and you know we were deciding on whose room is which i mean and uh, mama decides that this is meeta's room and this is mekin's room and i'm like no that that is the one that i want and he would just give it away it was so easy for him to just give it away okay fine you want it you take it ha to rakh <laughs> no thank you it's i think the amount of kindness in this space and what i have received uh, thank you so much yeah so uh, one thing uh, which uh, you know when we spoke with uh, people who know you right uh, and they all said that uh, that you are incredibly generous uh, so uh, what is uh, giving taught you and about letting go and embracing the unknown that's like if you have any thoughts on that yeah i i, I feel like uh, there i'll just go back to and uh, reuse the lai lama quote that nipun bhai just shared i do it for my own selfish reason it just gives me joy <laughs> i feel happy about it um yeah so and i think uh yeah what it taught me is that it is joyous that that just uh and i don't even i feel it i feel the moment you think of it as giving and um like one of the challenges and you touched upon this piece about how why i visualize myself as gandhari at sometimes i also visualize myself as aljun at sometimes but those are errors uh but because it's like hey would my giving make the other person smaller right um would my giving make the other person weaker is it good for the short term but not good for the long run uh and and a lot of those questions and self doubt have um have made have made dealing with my privilege my ability to do or my ability to give like uh a struggle so so i think that's that's an area that i struggle in i feel the unknown uh huh, that's a lot more or feels a lot more struggle free to me it's just uh i'm a i'm a huge fan of star trek uh, uh yeah so captain kirk and uh spock and uh yeah i think those lines there which is like just going and exploring right with no agenda right but just the agenda of exploration um of what's possible right and to me that's what the word potential means that's what uh, possibility or entrepreneurship really mean of like testing what's possible or figuring out what might we be able to do um yeah it's just i feel the curiosity that's uh, been probably a central power around hey this is what uh, i should try so making before before we let you go i have to ask this so how do you think because this also connects various threads because you've said a couple of times that letting go is actually brings you a lot of joy brings you a lot of happiness but this is so radically counterculture because in our in our culture we actually uh you know emulate those who accumulate the most not who let go of the most and so what you're saying in a way is very counterculture to what a young child kind of growing up in in this kind of global even global culture i think anywhere you go your heroes are often the ones who have actually kept the most and not who have let go the most and so how do you think uh we can bring the like what seems to be coming so naturally to you even before all this like you know at 3 and 4 you want the room you got it you know um how 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 do you think we can teach that in schools or can it even be taught yeah i i i don't know nipun i think uh it goes back to two or three things one is um one is just uh, intrinsic motivations like what are we motivated towards and just how much we get to practice that how much we get to experience it and uh, a little bit of self awareness but um, as you were speaking i was reminded of uh, another of our gandhi 3.0 uh, 
uh, colleagues, uh, Dacker, and uh, his conversations about power. So, um, and the power paradox is easily like uh, one of uh, one of the most amazing books I've read um, in in the last maybe five six years, uh, which so beautifully talks about that what it takes to get power is the giving, right? It's the giving that makes you powerful, right? That you grow in power as you give, right? But then as you become more powerful, right? There is something that happens in the human brain and that makes it really, really hard to then continuing to be that, continuing to be on that path. So the path that takes you there versus what then happens to you as a result, what it makes you, um, and we discuss this in terms of like, hey, what are you becoming in the process? So what? So keeping an eye and being an observer and like, hey, what are you becoming in the process becoming so important? Or like the stories I have told myself that I don't want to be this rich, powerful guy, right? I'm happy being a, a boy that's learning and problem solving. Uh, and it's almost an artificial story I've probably told myself and that story has kept me to who I am. Uh, but otherwise, like if we, so so some of those, so the answer, Nipun, if I were to attempt it and don't know if I should, but is is the stories we tell, uh, right? Is uh, the beliefs we build um, and and eventually what what we value. I, I think one challenge is that the human race is, um, is gamers and gamblers, right? We love games. Uh, Money is our largest game that we are playing. Uh, National pride is another large game that we play. Uh, but these are all games. These are man-made games. Artificial, we have made them. And like the Sapiens book puts it very bluntly and blatantly. So that's very useful for people to read and understand that, hey, just the difference between reality and man-made games to be able to put some of those in perspective. But one way is for people to become uh, aware that these are all games. And the second is uh, a shorter term way might be like, hey, designing games that actually uh, enable more, more giving, more service, more joy. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Megan. We have actually crossed our 90 minute mark <laughs> like a few minutes back. Uh, but just if you have a couple more minutes to stay. Um, first of all, I would like to just say a big thank you, not only from me, but uh, we are getting a lot of comments and questions and a lot of people kind of share their gratitude for, you know, uh, for your journey, for what you shared. And uh, we have one more person who echoes maybe like the same feeling. So let's see who that is before we, we close our call. <laughs> We are really blessed. मैं हर incident पे हमेशा मैं उसको ये नहीं समझती मतलब ऐसा नहीं समझती कि मेरा बेटा है ये भी एक आत्मा है और वो अपनी journey पे है और ये हमसे belong करती है that is you know my मत मैं अपना graceful मतलब भगवान का बहुत ही मान रखती हूँ भगवान को बहुत thanks करती हूँ it is great मतलब हमारे लिए बहुत ही अच्छी बात है मतलब कि इस सोल से हम बिलोंग करते हैं हमको ऐसा पद दिया मतलब ऐसा पद दिया है भगवान ने कि ये हम हमारे से मतलब पैदा भी हुआ है और हमारे घर में पल रहा बढ़ रहा और अब आज पूरी दुनिया के लिए वो काम कर रहा है तो इसके लिए हमेशा हर पल भगवान को थैंक से निकलता है <laughs> Wait, I think I talked about limited greed or unlimited greed, and this is like unlimited kindness. Thank you so much, Service Space. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, folks. This is like. Thank, thank you for like, you know, for how your mom kind of, you know, just shared from her heart. Like, I think she blessed all of us with what she shared. And the person, the volunteer who spoke with your mom, she he, he, he tagged this video saying Khalil Gibran moment, right? Like where children come through you, right? So it's so profound what, uh, you know, your mom also shared. And we have one final question that, you know, if there is a way individually or collectively, you know, if we could serve, uh, you, uh, you know, 
Just let us know. How could we serve you in your journey? And, and your vision for the world, right? Like how, how can we be ladders to your possibility? And it's a selfish ask because as you know, we, we are gonna be the ones gaining from it. <laughs> yeah, I, I, so I think a few things like right from the first set of interaction and questions, like this journey of this Awakened Talk itself has led to many reflections and uh, many things that, I've, that I would love to explore more. I would love to both with myself, with all of you uh, to see possibilities. Uh, Nipun, as you were discussing about uh, specifically the like the for-profit and non-profit tech platforms and scale and impact, and so that's been an area which I have been discussing with a few other people. Like uh, there is this guy Donald Lobo, uh, who was Bharat's mentor at Yahoo. So I I joke with him and pull his leg. He's my grand mentor. Uh, right. And he's been serving nonprofits for the last 20 years, or uh, an open source vision uh, for the last 20 years. And I've been troubling him to discuss him, like why is why cannot a photo sharing platform be a nonprofit which allows for uh, photos that or which enables uh, photo sharing in a way that's a lot more valuing the individual versus using the individual right so so i feel and some of this there are actually live examples uh, there is a there is, most of most of the people might have visited goa and uh, seen that the the ola or uber apps don't work in goa right uh, there is a locally owned cab app right which is almost built out of a cooperative not very different from the model that vergis kurian talks about uh, right? that is serving the drivers while serving customers. So like one of the models uh, of, of cooperative uh, platforms uh, is possibly something for us to explore, but I'm leaving that thought here for both for Unipon and then folks in service space and the listeners. If those are areas people would want to explore or are already on journeys of exploring, I would love to listen to them participate in the journey in any way that I can. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Macon, uh, for who you are. And most of all, I think for your heart, like your mom said, I mean, uh, what an incredible thing for a mom to say, right? That, um, to, that man, I, I feel, I, I say thank you that I got to witness this, not in a possessive way, but just to witness a journey of a heart. Uh, that is that was already big and is getting bigger as it goes on. And she had many examples. We don't have time for that, you know. And of course, a mom's heart. Well, once once you get her going, she's going to be like, "Well, I could tell you how many stories do you want?" <laughs> you want to make my head go big. <laughs> <laughs> no, but there is genuine gratitude, you know. And and, and she feels that gratitude. A lot of people around you feel that gratitude. And I can say on behalf of Swara and I, I mean, we both feel that gratitude just being on this call and listening to your stories and the sincerity, I would say, with which you're holding these questions that if you don't know and you say, hey, I don't know how, how to spread compassion in schools, like, you know, and, and to say, but I'm inquiring. Uh, and so to actually embody that, you know, to be the change uh, and be that learner yourself through that, like that intern at Flipkart telling you, hey, you know, I, uh, your, your mobile site's not quite working. And then pretty soon he becomes a co-creator. And I think that happens because you take yourself lightly. And, and that's, I think, the reason why uh, we, you know, so many of us feel grateful um, that our journeys have crossed. And so in the spirit of gratitude, uh, n not just for, you know, the three of us who are visible on this call, uh, but also so many invisible people, like in your case, your sister and your wife and, you know, your mom and so many others, uh, certainly, Bharat Vijay, those are the four clips we saw, but so many others behind and so many others likewise behind Swara and behind me and all of it coming together in for some unknown possibility that is yet to be discovered. And, and so it's a real joy. And we usually end our calls uh, with just a minute of silence uh, to hold that impossible, which our minds can't hold, but our hearts can open into. Um, so it, maybe we just end with a minute of silence unless you had something else to add. No, thank you. 
Thank you. Just a minute of silence. <laughs> 